In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Today's Chaplain's Report, we are continuing our series in the book of Samuel. You may remember if you were watching the Chaplain's Report from Thursday that Saul, not yet King Saul, he has not been anointed. Samuel is out looking for who shall be the king of Israel. And then there's King Saul, who is just a boy, helping out his dad and looking for their donkeys, which have gone missing. That he is going to go and seek out God's counsel by meeting Samuel. And that's really where our story picks up here, is that God has now told Samuel, I'm going to bring the new king to you. He is going to show up about this time of day. He says he's going to be of the tribe of Benjamin, which of course Saul is. And so the Lord gets Samuel ready to receive the new king of Israel. And this is where we start our reading today in Samuel, or sorry, 1 Samuel 9, uh, 19 through 21. And it states, Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place, for you shall eat with me today, and in the morning I will go and will tell you all that is on your mind. As for your donkeys, which were lost three days ago, do not set your mind on them, for these have been found, and for whom all is, uh, for whom is all that is desirable in Israel. Is it, not for, is it not for you and for all your father's household? Saul replied, Am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel? And my father's, or sorry, and my family the least of the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then do you speak with me this way? This little episode in Saul's life is really fascinating for a couple of reasons. But as we've already said, he, at a very young age, because he's probably a man, but a pretty young man at this point, he already sees the value in God's advice. He already has a desire to seek out God's help. And he has a certain level of humility and wanting to not just be somebody that takes God's advice, but also gives back and contributes, that kind of thing. So we see a lot of Saul's character in his early life that is admirable. And of course, with the hindsight, we know eventually that that doesn't turn out to be, uh, that his character winds up being destroyed later on by himself. But in this particular episode, we see that Saul defines himself by a worldly standard. He seems to not have the confidence that he'll later display, and that confidence gives way to hubris and pride later on. But at this point, he does not see himself as a king. He sees himself as a, a lowly farmhand, and not just a farmhand, but a farmhand to a family that's, let's be honest, not all that prestigious. The tribe of Benjamin is the smallest tribe out of all of the tribes of Israel. If you count the other 12, because you have the uh, 11 tribes and then one of the tribes is split up into two, Benjamin's still the smallest of all the tribes of Israel. And of that small tribe, he's a member of one of the families that is the least prominent in that tribe. So to say that he is from humble roots would be a gross understatement. Remember, he only runs into the prophet because he's looking for his donkeys. I mean, it's not exactly the most uh, fancy or prestigious job that you can have. And yet we see this very humble Saul come forward and he's actually pretty baffled by the fact that Samuel wants anything to do with him. Like, not necessarily that he's just being polite to him, but the way that he words it and the, the way that he's talking to Saul here is 
oh, you're, you're going to be my guest. You're going to come up with me. You're going to be a person that is, is put in a place of prominence. We're going to dine together. And this is because Samuel, he hasn't told Saul this yet, but he's going to anoint him king over all of Israel. And Saul's just very confused by all this. He's not used to people treating him as though he is a person of importance. That's not something that he is accustomed to. And because of it, he's just kind of sitting there like, really, Samuel? It seems odd that you're wanting me to stay overnight and be your guest and, and dine with you and, and all these big fancy things when I'm just a guy looking for lost donkeys. That's literally the extent of, of the reason that I came here. And it's understandable that Saul sees himself this way. Remember that he's not the only person chosen of God that did this. In fact, a lot of them did. Remember Moses' reaction at the burning bush? Moses is just there like, um, God, are, are you sure? I'm really not the, the guy that you should be getting to do this. I mean, I, I can't handle this. I'm not a great talker. People in Egypt don't exactly like me. The only thing they know me for is that I'm a rogue prince that killed somebody. And so I really think you, you need to start looking in other places for your guy on this matter. And Saul kind of has a similar attitude, not quite as dismissive as Moses, but he's just kind of like, um, no, I, I'm not really the person that you think I am. I, and he tries to even explain away as like, look, I, I'm just a, a kid in a, a normal family that's, that's not even all that prestigious, all of these things. And remember, especially at this time in Israel, pedigree was everything. And so if you, if you weren't in with one of the bigger tribes or one of the larger families, one of the more wealthy families, one of the more prevalent families in Hebrew culture, like that was basically how they defined everything. And Saul didn't really have any of that, which I think was part of the reason that God chose him in the first place is to show him that, well, you're important to God no matter what. You're important to God. That background stuff doesn't matter to God. And by the way, since we brought up Moses, Moses is in a similar situation. Like all that stuff, all that baggage that Moses was carrying with him that thought made him unfit to be God's chosen prophet, God's like, yeah, I, I, it'll be fine. Go. I promise you, I'll, I'll take care of it. All the things that you're worried about, I'll fix it. Just go. And so... I think that that's something that, that we run into quite a bit as well. When we look at ourselves, and we tend to be our own harshest critic. Now, some people have the opposite problem, and Saul, even later in life, has the opposite problem as well, that he can't see his own flaws. But a lot of us tend to be our own harshest critic. And part of the reason is because we know ourselves better than anybody else, except for God. And that's also because we're looking at ourselves right now as though we should be a finished product and aren't. That's not how God sees us. See, God looked at Saul and saw the best version of what Saul could be. And in a lot of ways, Saul was a great king. He wound up being a terrible king before it was all said and done. But there were a lot of things that Saul did along the way that made him a really good king, made him somebody that God would want to have as his anointed king to lead his people. Saul didn't see it at this point yet, but God did. When he spoke to Moses at the burning bush, Moses didn't get it, but God did. He understood all of this stuff ahead of time. When we see God calling other prophets, like Isaiah, Isaiah's like, I, I'm a little young. God doesn't look at those things. Anything that we're carrying around, any baggage that we have, anything that we think makes us unfit for God's service, God looks at it and says, no, I can use you. Now, he calls us for different things. He calls us for different things at different times. But ultimately, that remains constant. That whatever it is that we think holds us back or makes it to where we can't do what God asks us to do, God will take care of it. He never leaves any of his workmen ill-equipped. Now, he may equip them with different things, with different talents, with different abilities, and he may do it for different purposes at different times, but ultimately, he never asks anything of us that he knows we would be incapable of doing. That's not who God is. And the same thing is true right here with Saul. Saul, who looked at himself and didn't see anything worth Samuel treating like somebody of importance, God looked at him and saw potentially a really great king. 
And the important thing about all that is not only did God see that, but he acted upon it. And even though God, because he knows all things, knew that Saul eventually was going to turn out to be a terrible king, ultimately he still gave Saul the opportunity to do what was right. He ultimately gave Saul the opportunity to serve him in a way that would be productive for both of them. And he does the same thing with us today. Yeah, we fail. Sometimes we fall short of what God wants us to do. We don't always accomplish the things that he sets out for us. But ultimately, there's always time to come back to him and to be the person that God envisioned us to be when he called us. The person that God knows we can be, not just the person we've allowed ourselves to become. If God made all of us and created all of us, don't you think that he made us adequately equipped for all of the things that he would ask us to do? Of course he would. He would be cruel and evil if he didn't. It would be sadistic even for him to require of us something that we are incapable of doing. That's why he sent Jesus in the first place. Because the thing that he wanted us to be, sinless, could only be accomplished through Christ. And so he gave us the only thing that we needed, the only thing that we lacked, to be in a right relationship with him. You see, God calls everybody for something, and he never dials a wrong number. He never gets the messages mixed up. He never gives us a task that was really meant for somebody else or somebody that's better than us or better suited for us. If God asks us to do it, it's because he wants us to do it, not somebody else. And he doesn't ask us things that he knows are beyond our own abilities. You see, ultimately, our excuses and limitations don't matter if we have God, because if we have God, we can overcome those things. Saul, unfortunately, did for, to, for a while and to a degree and then fell back into other problems. But think about all the people in the Bible that didn't. Think about how he calls Moses and, and Saul's successor, David, at times where they didn't have a lot to brag about from worldly standards, where the world would look at them and see nothing. God saw who they could be. And his divine intervention and providence worked to make them, or at least give them the opportunity to be that person. And that's the same God that does the same thing for us today. Stay the course, friends. My mother always said, if you can't say something nice about somebody, then you're probably talking about a leftist. Nah, I kid. But seriously, it would really help me out if you would like this video and subscribe to my channel. I'm sure my mom would appreciate it.